I'm humbled to be here presenting to people for whom I know this disease is incredibly dear to their heart for many reasons, including my colleagues in the research field. I think I was last here in 2008 or so when Byron sent me as one of his postdocs, and I think the selling point was I could talk, but I could play as well. So I fiddled at that conference too. So it's kind of fun to be back doing both. So I'm going to try to whip through a bunch of things right now and leave you hopefully mostly with the concept of what I think might be a different approach to trying to figure out how to manage this disease. So I think you've had a lot of basics, so I'll go through this quickly, but unless you understand the basics, it's hard to understand the concepts. So you all know about the disease. It's a fatal disease, presents with a variety of symptoms, and it's fast. So if you look at different strains, the most common strain of this disease, it can be four months and people pass away. I just had a patient recently, just last month, and he was dead in four weeks from the very first time he had a symptom. This is a fast disease. So what's going on in this disease? Well, if we think about it, we have our prion proteins sitting on a cell. Something happens. It converts to the wrong shape. And then it snuggles up and converts its neighbor. And this continues, and then it accumulates inside the cell, and then it spreads to other cells throughout the brain. And somehow, this process causes cell death. And shown here are some pictures of brain slice, uh, human brain with different types of prion disease. So everything in brown is the bad prion form, the misfolded protein. And I hope you can appreciate there are different patterns here. So the top one is sporadic CJD, the next one is variant, and the last one is GSS, which I won't pronounce because I know there's people here who speak German, and I can never get it right. But the key here is there's strains. There's a strain dependency here. So what do I mean by strains? Well, first of all, I've, I've represented here one potential conformation or shape of the prion protein, which I'll acknowledge is wrong, and I'm not going to get into the debate of which shape it's supposed to be. In fact, I'd rather just use this shape personally. Have you seen these, the fluffy microbes? You can buy your own stuffed prion if you want. The point is really strains we have a, a protein that can turn into many, many different shapes. And it's more complicated than this. I'm not saying that a bunch of squares is one strain, a bunch of circles is one strain, but rather it is a cluster of these that is one strain. This is the idea behind the cloud hypothesis uh, proposed by John Collinge. So if you're trying to treat this, suppose I have a drug that just targets squares, well, my strain shifts and I can't treat the disease. So this is this concept of drug resistance or conformational drug resistance. At the same time, suppose I could find something that kills all the conformations in that strain. Well, that only does one strain, and that also won't help me. So there's strain selectivity. That's another issue with this disease. So what are the treatment challenges and how could we possibly overcome them? Well, first of all, it's a rare disease. Why is that a challenge? Well, if you're trying to study patients with this disease or put them into a trial, that makes it incredibly difficult to do. Also, it's fast. So that means by the time we see patients, assess them, and even our diagnostics have improved dramatically, especially with the quick now that we use, but by the time we diagnose, their symptoms are advanced and the brain disease is advanced. So we're already batting at low average to try to find something to not only halt, but reverse the disease. So I can't do anything about it being rare and fast, but these other two issues, the drug resistance and the strain-specific specific effects, well, I argue we might be able to tackle that by using a combination therapy approach, and I'll talk about that a bit later. There's a couple other treatment challenges. First of all, there's poor translation moving from animal to human, and we have this blood-brain barrier, which is a, a hindrance to many drugs, and yes, you can do some of these approaches where you put it directly into the intrathecal space, as was discussed, but ideally, we'd like something that can cross more readily. So how do we deal with this issue? Well, that's where we need a humanized model, an appropriate human model, as was discussed earlier about possible astrocyte models. We really want something that's as translatable in a dish that we can study so that we have a higher chance of moving it into humans. So for the very simplified pathogenesis of prion disease, which I, I'm actually not even going to talk about PRPC levels and suppression, but I have some t thoughts on that we should address in questions. The three C's, conversion, clearance, cell death. 
These, in principle, are the areas I think we should target. So simply, we block conversion, we improve clearance, and we block cell death. Sounds lovely. I'm sure it's easy. No. Well, let's look at each one separately. So if we think about conversion, so we talked about the problem. If you can target several sites on the PRPC molecule, you may be able to prevent production of all the different strains. It's analogous to suppressing or reducing the level of PRPC. If you get rid of the substrate, you block all the strains. But here, even if you can just block different sites that initiate the different shapes, you might be able to block different strains. And we've done some of this work, as have others, uh, combining conversion inhibitors and seeing an enhanced effect. And our interest is in using drugs that are already FDA approved, they're safe for human use, and have shown some sort of anti-prion effect. And some examples I'll show here, quinacrine is notorious. It's been studied actually in humans and been found not to be effective. And that's where a lot of the discussion and evidence suggests a drug resistance effect. And chlorpromazine is another compound used in humans. We know that chlorpromazine and promazine bind here on the prion protein. And there's a suggestion that high dosages of quinacrine may also bind at a different site. They also bind PRP, scrapey as well. So in theory, if you have two compounds that bind in different regions, might you have an enhanced effect and reduce drug resistance? So just some basic data showing promazine's effect. So fortunately, now you've all seen Western blots. You're used to the three lines on the... On the, that I'm showing. So we can see at different dosages, you see a loss of uh, prion replication in scrapey infected cell culture. <clears throat> and quinacrine also has this effect. But look at the dosages. Dosages are always important to consider. So quinacrine is much more effective than promazine at the same dose of one micromolar. Now, if we combine them, so here I'm going to show you chlorpromazine. So I've got untreated cells. I've got quinacrine or chlorpromazine used at dosages which hmm, work a little bit but not great, and combining them together where they work much more efficiently. So that's the premise behind this, is to try to you know, improve a bang for our buck. Jumping now to clearance, how can we do that? How can we improve things like uh, autophagy or these mechanisms of clearance? Well, there's an interesting compound that's uh, recently been uh, investigated in prion disease called AR12, and this compound grew out of the cancer world, actually, um, but it's actually able to stimulate autophagy, which is a clearance mechanism, and if you actually put it into the same prion cell culture, it too can remove prion infectivity. So that's another possible candidate to use in combination. And you notice here, the one micromolar dose is also quite effective. Okay, and the third C, cell death. So what can we do for that? Well, the trick here, if you want to study cell death, this is where the importance of that model comes back. Because if you use the typical infected cell culture model, those cells replicate and keep dividing, and they're happy and healthy infected, but they don't die. So how can I test neural protection? Well, that's where you need the model. So the model my lab has been using, uh, which I'll show here is a prion disease in a dish, but it's actually called Prion Organotypic Slice Culture Assay, or POSCA, developed by the Aguzzi lab. Here you basically take a slice of mouse cerebellum, culture it in a dish, infect it with prions, and watch what happens. It becomes infected, you can infect it with different strains, and it develops the pathology very much like what we see in vivo, which is an advantage. It's trying to find this happy medium of the animal model versus a simple cell culture and finding that middle ground, which is not so complicated that you can still use it and still add treatments to it, especially if it's in a dish. You can just sprinkle treatments on top. You don't have to worry about a blood-brain barrier. So here's an example of what it looks like. So along the top, if you look at the white coloration, those are neurons and they're healthy. So over days of culture and different slices, you can see there's lots of neurons. But when you infect it, you lose the neurons. If you look more closely at the neurons themselves, you can look at what's called dendritic spines. And these spines are also normally shown here. We can quantify them and in disease state are lost. So there are elements in this dish of pathology that we see in both the um, brain or the animal and in the slice culture. Now, we also want to have drugs that are going to help protect against cell death. And thinking about apoptosis as one of the common uh, possible routes for cell death, we explored bile acids. Now, 
this sounds like a bit of a non sequitur, but let me bear with me. So bile acids, cholesterol is converted to ursocholic acid into ursodeoxycholic acid, which we'll call UDCA, into taro ursodeoxycholic acid, which we'll call TUDCA. Now, the interesting thing about these compounds is they actually have upstream and downstream effects. So upstream, they can actually help control or prevent proteins from folding into the wrong shape. And downstream, they actually have effects to stabilize the mitochondria and other pathways to inhibit apoptosis. So they might actually have one of these dual purposes as well. It was that that led us to wonder about whether they might be suitable in prion disease. And they're already uh, clinically approved for use in humans. They reach high levels in the CSF, and they cross the blood-brain barrier. And look, at there's been a number of papers that have looked at these compounds in other protein-folding diseases. So Huntington's disease, Parkinson's, all animal models, and Alzheimer's disease models, all of which showed some very significant effects. But more interesting, in humans with ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also a protein-folding disease. And in this case, in a very well-done, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial, giving patients a gram twice a day for 54 weeks with no significant side effects, they actually were able to slow the progression of ALS. Slow, not prevent, not cure, but there's a hint there. So with that, we thought, well, what happens if we take prion diseases and combine them with bile acids? What, what would have happened? So this is Tudka in Posca. We were thinking of calling it Tosca, but if any of you know opera, that doesn't end well, so we thought maybe we wouldn't call it that. Anyway, this is just to show that um, in the Western blot here, you can see that it does reduce the level of PRP scrapie that's being produced, but it doesn't eliminate it. And I actually am not showing here, maybe I should have, it does not affect the level of PRPC. So we did look at that as well. And what happens on the aspect of neuroprotection? Well, here I'm showing infected untreated. And here's what happened when we treated it with 500 micromolar tutka. So you can see there's some preservation of neurons or with 100 micromolar of utka. So spurred on by this, we thought, well, let's actually put it into animals and see what happens. And interestingly, if we treated the animals early, we did see an effect, at least in male mice, which is interesting. And the trick here is, I find often in science, there is statistical significance and there is clinical significance. So I think what we have here is statistical significance, but I don't know how clinically significant this really is. And we actually, we published this work, but went on to study it when given later in disease and found as many of these compounds, if you give it late in disease, it doesn't work. It's all about starting early. And you remember one of those treatment challenges? It's a fast disease. It means by the time you're seeing it, it's well underway. This is a recurring theme in prion disease uh, treatments. But what if you can use this in combination? Again, having something attacking each arm of the process. So to summarize, are you going to give me a warning? I'm right on time. To summarize, so this is the concept of our approach is, first of all, we need a humanized model. And in POSCA, what we can do is we have mice that express the human form of the prion protein that we can put into this model system and infect with CJD. And so that work is actually underway right now. These experiments are faster than in mice, but it can still take 50, 60 days to actually go through a full experiment. So that's underway. Then we want to use our combinations of conversion inhibitors. We want to add in our clearance enhancer as well as TUDCA to do all of these different arms. But more than just throwing some cocktail in there, we want to be strategic about it and look at the timing or the different stages of the disease. Because I suspect that we are going to see that certain treatments which work early may no longer have a role late. But for example, even blocking conversion. We know that the levels of PRP scrapie go up, 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 and then they kind of plateau. And here's an interesting question, because what happens to levels of PRPC later in disease? There's a disconnect in time between increasing levels of PRP scrapie in the brain and cells starting to die. What's going on in that intervening space? And is there a point of no return after which intervening is not going to work? I'm hoping that by actually growing the brain in a dish and picking specific time points, we can start to ask that question, where is this point of no return if it's there? Can we shift it 
by doing combination therapy. So, for the results, well, they're all still cooking, and uh, I hope to have the opportunity to present more of those at some other time, with or without a little fiddling on the side. So thanks for your attention.